If you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Of course, this uh, follows chapter 24, so that's... And uh, 24 uh, follows chapter 23. So if in your head you're Rolodexing those chapters, um, they're all pretty infamous... Um, as the last portion here of this book of Matthew before we get to, you know, the sacrifice of our Lord in in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's his last opportunity to speak to this nation, the nation of Israel. And we noted in 23 that he gave that great rebuke to the leaders of Israel. And and it's remarkable uh, the language that he uses against those because they were... They knew who he was, but yet they still rejected him. And we'll conclude tonight with a couple of awesome things for those who were unfaithful to the Lord. They didn't receive the Lord. And, um, but as he left there um, from that mountaintop, he, he basically said, you, your nation, uh, Israel, is, is left desolate. And, of course, that just shook the minds of the uh, apostles and disciples because they're like, okay, um, this means you're not going to, you know, um, we're not going to receive the kingdom. You're the Messiah and the Savior, and we're not going to be saved, and we're not going to be, you know, delivered here physically um, as what they were looking for the Messiah to do, deliver him from Rome, but also to set up his kingdom and all of that, and so staggering, but then he said, you know, not one stone's going to be left on another. And, 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 you know, as he walked off, he said, well, when, it, you know, the disciples are saying, well, when it, when's all this going to happen, you know? Because he did say, you're not going to see me again until. So there was this idea that Israel would see him again, but they've rejected him as their king. And they're like, well, you know, when is that going to happen? And when is your return going to be if you're leaving and I think they were thinking about that personally, like, are you, you're leaving us then? Are you leaving us too? And when are you coming back? And Jesus is going to explain all of that to them in further detail. But he launches out into this Olivet Discourse as he walks up the hill uh, on the Mount of Olives. And chapter 24, he lays out um, what we determined was this whole understanding about what's going to happen with Israel. Now, the Bible declares to us in the New Testament that Jesus was going to build his church. And, of course, we know 2,000 years later, there's been a whole church age here between that event there and the events that are going to happen with Israel. But God does have a plan for Israel. And, and uh, we, you know, Jesus didn't give us a whole historical layout of, of the next 2,000 years He just jumps right to the point, and I believe it is, he leaves out all of the church age, and there's a lot of Jewish people that have been saved during that time, a remnant that's been saved throughout that time. But he's going to launch specifically going like full circle to to basically the time that he comes back in one more time, and and what's the reception going to be like when he returns. And so um, 24 was about an announcement that, Things are going to get really bad. And uh, I mean really bad. He says it's never been that bad before. uh, Specifically for you, Israel. And he begins to lay out all of that to them. Uh, Verse 1. It says, Then, which means at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Let me pray for us. Lord, again, we, we understand that this is specifically uh, speaks to um, your people and regarding your city, just like the angel told Daniel um, 2,500 years ago. And uh, Lord, we know it, it isn't referring to us Um, individually here as believers in the church, but Lord, it is still given to us in your scriptures, and and Matthew wrote this down. It's important for us to know that you're still working 
um, in regards to your physical kingdom, your second coming. And uh, Lord, that has a lot to do with this nation who rejected your son. And Father, we're thankful, Lord, to be able to read it and understand that they're going to be given an opportunity, one more opportunity, to receive your Son as their King. And uh, it's, it's a joy in our hearts to know, Lord, that, that uh, um, Israel will open their hearts to your Son and they'll receive Him as their King and you will honor them in that, in your coming kingdom. So give us wisdom to understand this. Uh, it helps us, Lord. Uh, to understand the end times, and uh, we want to understand the last things. And so open this to our hearts and minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we left this last uh, section in chapter 24, Jesus gets up to this middle portion of the tribulation so much spoken of about that tribulation as a whole seven years, but there's a turning point in that seven years for Israel specifically. And so that time is often referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. So it doesn't mean that the other half of the tribulation isn't trouble. It is trouble. And there will be a lot of things that will happen on the earth. And of course, a lot of it is you know, the deception of the Antichrist in building. But these two chapters here build up to this time as Jesus is speaking about. He's saying, but when you see, and, I, and again, that's marked. Daniel marked it as the middle, three and a half years in. When you see the abomination uh, of um, desolation, that, you know, this is the time when it's going to get really bad. And so he tells them, he says, if you're living in Judea, you need to get out of there. And um, why? Because at that same time, the Antichrist has decided that he will announce himself as God to the world. And he's going to, you know, he's already planned. And Daniel speaks about it too, this statue that he sets up and the Bible speaks of it and going to be pretty amazing uh, according to the Bible. It's going to be able to talk to people and <clears throat> tell them everything about themselves as well, but it's going to be an image for the world to, to look at and to worship him, and that is, of course, Satan who's behind uh, the Antichrist. And so um, at that time, uh, Jesus said, run, take off, leave, and there's going to be a mass exodus. Now, I was thinking about this, so many angles to this time, because for three and a half years, uh, they've been in the good graces of this Antichrist. He's signed a peace treaty that started the seven years, seven-year peace treaty, and you know, halfway through, he's going to break the, the deal, but up to this point, you know, they're looking to him kind of as a savior, as a Messiah. So um, they haven't been the prime target here. And up to this point, we haven't seen a national surrender to Jesus. And so um, uh, at, at the time of this happening, a lot of them are still seeing the Antichrist as their Messiah until this happens, and then they realize you are not the Messiah. You're not fulfilling what the Messiah, you know, would do. And so this exodus, it's going to be important for us to understand, is a large group of people who are fleeing the Antichrist. But that doesn't mean that they all believe in Jesus. It just means they know they got to get out of here. And so... Um, uh, you know, here they are in, in this predicament, and we read last week that the Lord's going to actually supernaturally help them get out of there, and, and He's going to watch over them for a time, times, and half a time. And so that means he's gonna have, they're going to have a supernatural hand over them. Now, during those three and a half years, you know, we, we, just, we just don't know, but I, it, it looks like a lot of the rest of the Jews who have not migrated back to Israel, which many are, 
I'm thinking of so many Jewish people in America as well because they're not being persecuted. But I'm thinking as we're reading through this that it looks like many, many of those Jewish people, if not most of them, will have migrated then into Israel. And Israel is still seeing a mass you know, um, immigration situation. And um, so we're talking about a good portion of all of Israel that's going to be taking off in this, uh, at this time. And uh, so Jesus is starting to speak about, at the last part of chapter 24, um, about this in regards to being ready for when he comes. The time that he comes, looking for the day that he comes. Of course, if they don't believe in Jesus yet, they're not looking for his coming. So this last section of 24 and then in all through 25 have to do with what occurs during these last three and a half years. And it's interesting to, to, to read it. So he's warning in the last part of chapter 24 those who um, to wait until he comes. And, and they're the ones who will be saved. So we're talking physically. The rest are going to die. They're going to be hunted and killed. And, and, um, and so it's important. Uh, um, only the ones who live physically to the end are going to be the ones who are going to be entering into the kingdom with, with the Lord. Um, they understand that they should understand from Jesus' writing here, but if they're not believers yet, they might not even fully understand uh, what's going on. But basically, he said, listen, it's like if I told you a thief was coming tonight, and you knew that a thief was coming, and you knew it, wouldn't you be ready for him when he came? And uh, you would be. You might not know the time of the night that he's coming, the hour of the night that he's coming, but you would probably be waiting all night long and being ready for when he gets there. And so it's the same idea. They don't know exactly, they're not going to know exactly when the Lord is going to actually touch down and come here, but they, they, they should understand that uh, the times are now and they should be, uh, again, looking for him. And so a lot's going to happen in those three and a half years, that big old mixed multitude that's out there you know, um, and other Jews around the world in this uh, preparation for this second coming of the Lord, that's, which they missed the last time, which is why he's writing all of this. And so it's, it's really important. And uh, a lot is written in the uh, Old Testament about this season, three and a half years. So question, if the Bible tells us the Lord's going to return in three and a half years, um, from the point of this abomination of desolation, how, how can they not know? Well, that's part of the reason why is because a lot of them don't believe in the Lord yet. So they, they either haven't heard this yet or they uh, don't believe it yet. So they just know that guy's not our guy. But it doesn't mean yet that they believe that Jesus is the one uh, yet. And so if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 12 and I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles and then just mark it or hold it with your finger because it's interesting because everything that Jesus is saying has already been revealed to Daniel and he's just given a little bit more clarification on some things here so from chapter 9 all the way through 12 we get this unfolding the end of chapter 9 ends with this you know coming prince that's gonna you know defile um, uh, the temple, and, and then he begins to go and talk about what's going to happen during this time. So if you think about it, Israel's got three and a half years to get it done. It's like being, you know, sieged by an enemy, you know, and the Bible writes about, you know, all that happened during this siege of this enemy, and usually Israel would, you know, be faithless and they would try to flee or they wouldn't trust the Lord or whatever it is. And so this is the same thing that's happening. So in Daniel chapter 12, I'm just going to read verses 10 through 12. We'll, we'll look at it in many parts of these uh, 11 and 12, the last two chapters of Daniel, because they speak about the same time. 
It says, many will be purged, purified, and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. I told you, I said, you know, these chapters, (laughs) they're not directed to us. We're not even in these uh, two chapters up to this point. And, uh, but it will be here on the earth. The Word of God will be here on the earth for those who want insight and want to understand it. But uh, you have to believe the Lord uh, and, and, again, part of that receiving the Lord. Then insight and understanding will unfold, just like it is for us. Unbelievers don't understand what's going to happen in this world. They have no concept, no idea of it. We know. And because we're believers filled with the Holy Spirit and we can read the Word of God and we can understand what, uh, what we're in. And so, now, if you're holding your finger there, um, the angel explains a little bit more about this in Daniel 11. So just a little bit back uh, there. Uh, we'll start in verse 33 through 35. And it says, and those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. We know it's going to be three and a half years, right? Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help and many will join with them in hypocrisy. So during those three and a half years... You know, in the end, uh, he's going to have a group that's trusting in the Lord and waiting on him. But during that time, there's going to be many who will say, no, I don't believe. Or I'm going to, you know, believe in the Antichrist. Or I'm going to, as Jesus said, go out into the desert looking for something else. Or, uh, you know, I don't think the Lord is going to come, right? As many of his parables were talking about. They didn't really believe that the Lord would actually show up. And and so all, kind, all, all those things are going to happen. There's going to be a group that are going to, go out into the desert and they're, and they're believers and they're going to begin to witness to the other Jewish people, right? And many, and we're going to see that, many are going to believe and, uh, on the Lord and they're going to be looking and they're going to be waiting and they're going to be faithful at the end uh, when the Lord uh, returns. And he says, now, uh, when they fall, yeah, they'll be granted. Verse 35, some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and uh, make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. In other words, uh, that season hasn't yet uh, arrived. So, uh, very interesting uh, section of Scripture uh, there. And um, again, already been written about as Jesus goes in and explains now here in chapter 25 this parable of the ten virgins. And he's going to give several parables. He's, he's already been talking about you know, uh, these things um, in regards to them waiting, being faithful, being ready when, when he comes. And we say, why is that so important? Again, we say it, it's because last time they weren't ready and they weren't prepared. And they weren't willing to believe on the Lord uh, when he did show up in Jerusalem and declared himself as their Messiah. So, um, Daniel chapter 12, uh, back to chapter 12. There's another reason why there's going to be a little bit of confusion Regarding the Lord at the end, even at the end of the three and a half years. Now this, I can't go into everything about this, but it's very fascinating because this angel is giving Daniel all the revelation that he needs to go all the way to the end, right? That's what he told uh, him in, in, in 9. I'm going to give you, through the 77s, I'm going to give you the layout of all prophecy, that fulfilling all about redemption and salvation and all of it. And uh, so... He's still speaking to Daniel in chapter 12, and it says, verse 11, From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. And then he goes on and says in verse 12, How blessed is he who keeps waiting, which is what they're doing. They're waiting for his announcement or his 
marching into Jerusalem, right? And they're going to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, that's, that's the goal. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and, and attains to the 1,335 days. So, three and a half years in the Jewish calendar is 1,260 days. So if we're looking from the time of the abomination that causes desolation, you could just add 1,260 days, three and a half years, and you'd know the day. But then he adds in these, uh, this 30 days. No, it's going to be 1,290 days. So many people have speculated what's going to happen, you know, because at that time, um, he is going to, before he puts the statue up, he's going to stop the sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. So um, it's possible that he, he stops the sacrifice there or he announces that he's going to put up this you know, statue there, uh, there and declare himself as God. And then it takes 30 days to get all of that set up. Right? And put all that in place. But the temple sacrifice has already been, um, you know, stopped here. And so they, we got an extra 30 days. Or it could be a literal three and a half years from there. But, but there's still going to be 30 more days before the Lord actually comes in, into Jerusalem. Now, we've explained this to you a couple of times. I have, anyway. Um, that... The Bible says he's going to appear in the air and all the nations are going to look at him. Not just Israel. The whole world's going to look at Jesus in the air. And there's quite a few events that are going to happen and are explained by uh, the Lord in the book of Revelation at the end of things he's going to do, possibly from the air. And, uh, and so they're going to mourn over him and all of that. And, and, um, and so there could be a uh, some things that are happening there at that time. But if you look at that, he's saying is, but you got to wait all the way till the 1,335 day mark. As if maybe that's the day that he actually goes up into Jerusalem, right? Comes down on the mountain, has been prophesied as well, splits the mountain, goes in, all that. So <laughs> you've got 30 days there, and then an extra 45 days on top of that. And so that's a, a, a variance of 75 days. So a couple of things. If they're not truly believing, as what this passage is talking about, the virgins, some of them, five of them have the oil in their lamps, five of them don't have the oil in their lamps, um, then that could be an issue because they don't, they're, they're not going to wait. They're, they're not really even looking because they're not believers, right? And then the other part of it is, is even if they you know, uh, were looking for him and he comes, they're like, well, but is he actually going to come? Is he actually going to establish this? You know, what in the world is going on? And so it'll be a time of confusion. And um, uh, so a lot of things that, that, that can be taking place. Uh, during that time he could be defeating the armies and his enemies on the earth which he's going to do in the battle of armageddon right um, or gathering the elect from the ends of the earth he's going to do that also at the end as the judgments come uh, to place and again a lot of those are believers from all kinds of countries and nations all over the earth and he'll be gathering them and they're going to be invited in to this marriage feast that's going to happen as well and and uh, that could be part of the time. Um, he, he said he's going to put away Satan. And uh, that'll happen before he actually goes in and has this marriage feast. And, and uh, at the beginning uh, of his kingdom, the demons. The uh, Bible says he's going to get rid of the Antichrist, put him away, the false prophet. Um, and then he talks about a couple of different things that are going to happen. Events are going to happen at that time too. Is there's going to be a resurrection and uh, he says specifically in the book of Revelation that at that time, there's going to be a resurrection um, and of all the martyred um, saints, all those who died during the tribulation, which would be Jew and Gentile, and they're going to be resurrected. And that, what does that mean? That means they're going to get their new bodies, glorified bodies. Why? So they can rule and reign with Christ. And um, if we look to the end of Daniel 
chapter 12, where you're at, verse 13, he says this to Daniel. But as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. Basically, you'll, you're going to die. You'll go to your death. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. And we're going to talk about the portioning that's going to go on. And so this idea, that's why I've said several times, I don't know that the Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected at the rapture. Sounds like it's just going to be the church. The dead in Christ will rise first and all of that. But of course, Old Testament saints were looking ahead to the Messiah as well. And so it looks like for Daniel that possibly the Jewish people there are going to wait, are going to be held until the end of that time, three and a half years there, um, um, already have souls, right? They're, they've already been, you know, as just like the uh, martyred dead during the tribulation, they, they're robed and they have white robes, but they don't have their glorified bodies. So at, at that time, part of the time that we're talking about in the days could be about that resurrection, what is Jesus doing? He's getting all of the, the, the resurrections are finished. Those who are part of the first resurrection. There's only going to be one more resurrection. That's all the wicked dead. So at this point, he's gathering all of those who are going to rule and reign with him. And then he's going to go to Jerusalem, right? And he's going to be establish uh, his kingdom. So that time could be spent uh, the same uh, way. So... When he starts out here, at that time, verse 1, I think we're still talking about this time, the three and a half years, okay? Um, so we're still in that time before Jesus goes into Jerusalem, because it's going to be uh, the end of it. He's going to explain that in this uh, thing as well, um, this next uh, section, and so... Just so we're clear, the ten virgins do not speak of the church. So can you imagine if you were reading these chapters and trying to put the church in all of this? It wouldn't make any sense biblically. It wouldn't match any of the Old Testament prophecies. And you'd be talking about the church. But if you're faithful till the rapture, then you're going to go. But if you're not faithful, you're going to... Wait a minute, believers that are not faithful? And then, you know, is, is it works that we're doing or whatever it is? Then now we're talking about salvation by works. No, no, no. It doesn't have anything to do with the church. It has to do with Israel, and it doesn't have to do with all of Jews for all time. Some of them have died in faith already. It just has to do with these people here in this last time. Isn't that amazing? Because it just ends up being this last Seven years, in this last specifically three and a half years, that's going to determine which physical, still alive Jewish people that make it to the end of the tribulation are going to be a part of the setting up of the kingdom of the Lord, which fulfills all the rest of the Old Testament prophecies, which are thousands, that, um, um, that he will rule on David's throne and he'll rule forever and they will rule and reign with the Lord on the earth, physical promises, physical kingdom, a physical thousand years, right? So hopefully our brains are clicking all of that together. So just ends up with this last group of Jewish people that are here on the earth. And Jesus is speaking about them and he's saying, you know, that group is going to trust me. And I will find faith when I come uh, there. And I will take them and I will, this time... I will put them, I will declare myself king, and I will put them and set them up to be a, a part of my kingdom. So if you didn't catch that about the millennium, the Jewish people are very prominent in the millennium because they will be where Jesus is and the world, all the Gentiles, will have to travel from around the world to come in to the house of the Lord and, uh, and, and, and speak with the Lord and all of that. They'll still be in human bodies, physical bodies, not like us that are ruling and reigning with them. And so it's going to be very important to be right there with the Lord. And of course, that fulfills all the promises that God gave uh, to Israel. You will not understand the Bible at all if you don't understand that God still has a plan for Israel. You can't understand the end times. The 77s make no sense to you if you don't realize that's for 
your people and your city. I mean, you just checked out on understanding the Bible. Can you imagine sitting in churches that don't even believe that? Don't even believe that God has a plan for Israel and they're trying to teach their people chapter 24 and 25? I mean, you know, you could say, well, it's part, partly the Jews, and, but, but it's also partly the, the Christians. Okay, well, you, you get a little bit out of that. But if you say it's not about the Jews at all, then there's no way you'd even have a clue of what uh, this is speaking about. But the Lord brings us um, uh, a lot more clarity here. So here we go. It'll go faster now. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So, if they're going out to meet him, Jesus said, make sure you're going out to meet me, and then it's really me. And you'll know it's me when you see me, right, as lightning in the sky, and you will know that's who you are. And so they went out to meet the bridegroom. Apparently, um, uh, they were going to, um, they're still waiting on him to come here, but they're going to be going to um, probably Jerusalem uh, there during this time. And uh, they're going to meet with him. So it could be that whole group that went out from uh, Judea, all of it into the desert. And now it's a group being prepared. Because speaking of all of Israel here with the ten virgins. And them coming back uh, to the Lord. So possibly they lost half of that population during that time uh, that went out. Again, uh, some left, some took other thought other things were the Messiah, some did not wait till the end, and all of that. Horrendous persecution and time. Uh, it's not that easy to wait uh, during that time. So, um, it says, verse 2, Five of them were foolish and five prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no, no oil with them. So the oil, again, we know prominently is about regard to the Holy Spirit. And so um, we can also see that half of them as they went out you know, weren't believers or during that time of the three and a half years, um, half of them didn't have oil, the other half did. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Again, this is a parable, so it doesn't go completely straight across. Um, um, but what's the difference between the wise and the foolish? Well, it was the oil in their, in their jars. So uh, verse 5, now while the bridegroom was de uh, delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. And so this is going to be a tough, tough season. It's going to be a draining time uh, for Israel, the harshest time the world has ever seen, but also they'll be in the center of it. And they're weary. But at but at midnight, there was a shout, behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. So we know at this point, it is the time that they are to go meet the Messiah. And uh, whatever days those were, 45 days, 30 days, all of that. Uh, it says, the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answers, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in uh, with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. So this is a a physical kingdom that we're talking about, Jesus is setting up. But as we see here, it requires a spiritual commitment to the Lord. Um, this isn't about just physically making it to the end. This is about saying that, Lord, you're Messiah, Jesus, you're my Savior. Hosanna, Hosanna. Verse 12, but he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. And it's similar to what uh, he says in other passages. Many will say, you know, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Did we do that today? If he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. 
Either you believe on him or you don't. You have a relationship with Jesus or you don't. And um, again, not all of them were believers um, there at that time. It says, be on alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And so, um, again, this emphasis, be trusting, be waiting, and be, again, with oil in your lamps, looking for Jesus as your Messiah and Savior uh, to come. And uh, then you'll be ready uh, to receive the Lord. Um, and that's what he descends on, on the earth. It says, the virgins basically went out to meet the bridegroom, um, but it, it took longer than they expected. They, they didn't know the day. Um, when he would actually, you know, declare himself as Messiah. And again, this goes back to Jerusalem, doesn't it? That's where they would, again, declare him there and, as their king. Um, um, for uh, believers, Christ's coming is an expectancy, a hope. It's not something we're trying to make it to the end, right? Or to make sure we're faithful to the end. It's two totally different things altogether. Um, for us, it's just a glorious hope. But also, for us, we're not described in the Bible as the virgins. We're described as the bride. Okay? So it's interesting as we, um, uh, we look here that the groom gets the bride, gets her ready, then he takes the bride from her home to his home, and then they have the marriage feast. And so Israel is not the bride. And that's sad, isn't it? Because the Lord wanted them to be the bride, and that's why he was weeping and it was sad over that day that he stood there on, on the mountain there. Um, but even in the millennium, when they're ruling and reigning in their physical bodies there as a representation of fulfilling all these prophecies, they're not the bride. The bride's going to be the bride. And as those who've chosen to put faith in Christ, can during this uh, church season, we're going to come as the bride of Christ and um, two different things uh, all together. So, interesting section. Kind of concludes this a little bit. Um, he goes into another parable now, and, and this is written about a lot in the Old Testament as well, and it is about, and he's speaking to Daniel um, in chapter 11, as we'll read too, that you're going to receive your blessings. I'm going to reward you. Now, when we, when we die and, and, uh, and you know, stand before the Lord, and then say the rapture takes place. The Bible says there's a, there's a judgment that we'll go through as well. But our judgment is called the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema judgment. We're not going to be judged there for being faithful or believing uh, on the Lord. Because we're not going to be judged for our sin uh, or any of that. All that is about is reward. So in the same way... As Israel now is going to be rewarded according to their faith. And this is, again, this is just a small section of the history of Israel. This is just those in the, in the last three and a half years that were alive on the earth. So this reward is not, um, it's not a, a, an eternal you know, reward here. Uh, this is a physical reward for what they're going to receive to rule and reign with the Lord physically in their bodies you know, ahead of time. Ours is an eternal one uh, that's going to be given out there as we stand before the Lord. Um, and we'll have our glorified bodies there and he'll reward us um, and we'll be placed in different parts of his kingdom or with different authority and different roles in that kingdom. It's interesting that he says the same thing for them. Let me read. For it, it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves, and entrusted his possessions to them. It's kind of like the Lord leaving, going away from the temple there, dying on the cross, going back to the Father. And he's entrusting these possessions with, uh, with Israel. 
To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received, I like that, immediately, got to work. Um, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and he gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away. It's interesting. He went away, and he dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, again, we're talking about waiting and for the return of the Lord, the master of those slaves came, and he settled accounts with them. That's what the Lord's going to do with Israel when he comes back into his kingdom. The one who had received the five talents came up and and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you've entrusted me with five, talent, uh, five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful uh, slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. It's going to be interesting as he lays out the 12 tribes. If you go to the book of um, Ezekiel, he says in there how he's physically going to rebuild the temple there. Uh, the whole ground is going to be changed, to top, uh, the topography of the ground. And, and he's going to put all of them in there. Remember, he's promised Abraham these, this land and the measurement of it. And each one's going to inherit part of the land according to the tribe that they're about. And, and so it's going to uh, have to do with... Um, their status, you know, um, in the kingdom um, and their allotment in the kingdom. And so this, these guys have been faithful here um, um, over this. And he says, I'll put you in charge of many things. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and he said, Master, you've entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. And uh, you were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So the Lord wants to reward. He wants to, to um, um, reward them for their faithfulness. And the one who uh, also who had received one talent came up and he said, Master, I knew you were uh, to be a hard man. Again, that was, his, that was his vision or view of the Lord. Very different. Reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. In other words, you're like a harsh master. And I was afraid and I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you, you have what is yours. But his master answered and he said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I uh, scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put uh, my money in the bank and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. In other words, whatever portion it was for that person in the kingdom, as whatever tribe that he was a part of, that portion was now given to somebody else who was faithful in that. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he, he does have, shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, as we're going to see, the Lord's going to do the same thing with the Gentile nations. Anybody who's alive at the coming of the Lord, who survives all of that, but there will be people from nations all over the earth. And the Lord's going to go through and sift through all of that as well, isn't he? And, uh, and we're going to see that next. And so they're not the only ones that are going to come under this, but really it's going to come down to either you trusted in me or you did not trust in me. I mean, in Second Thessalonians, I mean, Paul just says, listen, it comes down to either you love the truth or you rejected the truth. And then the judgment has come because you would not, and you would not love the truth. You would not accept the truth. And, but there will be judgment. And again, they'll be put away. And I think they're waiting another judgment, uh, which is the final judgment. as called the great white throne judgment for everybody who's rejected the Lord. Bible's pretty consistent about that and uh, speaks about it. 
John Wilford, here's what he writes. He says, in another parable, in another parable on faithfulness, Luke 19, 11 through 27, Jesus told the story of a master with three servants. The master went on a journey and gave each servant a specific amount of money, talents. The talents were silver in this uh, um, story. Uh, a talent weighed between 58 and 80 pounds. Thus, the master entrusted his servants with a cons- considerable amount of money. The amounts were, uh, were in keeping with the men's abilities, just like we see here. It says, um, and it says two of the servants were faithful in caring uh, for the master's money and were accordingly rewarded for their faithfulness with additional wealth. Additional responsibilities and sharing of the master's joy. The third servant, having received the one talent, reasoned, this is again his interpretation of it, that his master might not be coming back at all. After a while, you're starting to think, well, you know, I still got that money there in the hole. He's not, I don't, know, don't look like he's coming back, Right? And he says, um, if he did return someday, the servant could simply return the talent to his master without the loss from any poor investment. But if he failed to return, the servant wanted to be able to keep the talent for himself. He did not want to deposit the talent in a bank where he would be recorded that the talent belonged again to the master. His reasoning indicated that he lacked faith in his master. He proved to be um, a worthless servant. Um, And again, parallel to a lot of the other stories where uh, we're either going to kill the king so we we can take the inheritance or I don't believe the king is coming back so we'll squander his his inheritance or take it for ourselves. His reasoning, uh, again, a a lack of faith and he lost what he had and he was cast out into uh, judgment where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth which is parallel with um, uh, uh, hell, right? And it says, the parable of the ten virgins stressed the need to, uh, for preparedness for the Messiah's return. And he says, this parable of the talents stressed the need to serve the king while he is away. So just like for us, two different things there. We're going to stand before the Lord. We're not going to have to be accountable for our sin. But we will face a judgment as for what we did with what we had. And uh, uh, were we faithful to the Lord? The works that we did for the Lord, the Lord says, I will reward you for that. Sad in that story that there will be some who will not receive any rewards. But it says they'll still enter in. But as smell of, with a smell of fire and smoke, which is its own uh, sad case. But the Lord does want to reward us and he rewards them too. Finally, now last section, the sheep and the goats. Again, self-explanatory here, but it says when the Lord returns, basically in His glory, He's not going to just judge the nation of Israel, as we'll see here, um, but He's going to um, uh, also judge all of the Gentiles. It's going to be basically the same, uh, a standard, a test there to see if they believed in the Lord or didn't believe in the Lord. Um, This is not the great white throne judgment, the separation from the sheep and the goats, not the end You know, judgment. Sometimes um, people will interpret that this this way. Usually because they reject the idea that Israel is going to be judged uh, or um, going to be around. And uh, they're going to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. So if they move that out, then who's left? It's just a judgment that the Lord, you know, comes and gives. And that's going to be interesting. Um... Because for those who don't believe in a coming of the Messiah, then usually they don't believe in a seven-year tribulation either. That's the second coming of the Lord. And then now they're going to have trouble with the millennial kingdom, aren't they? Because if, if there's no physical king coming to a physical group of people, Israel, and ruling and reigning in Jerusalem... For a thousand years, then we have to spiritualize all of that. And then that means the millennium to them just means a time of peace on earth. But they still have the problem with the white throne judgment because there's still going to be a judgment at the end. So a lot of those groups, 
basically believe everything's just going to keep going along, going along, going along, and eventually the Lord's going to show up. And he's just going to judge the whole earth. Great white throne judgment. So to them, it's just the, the one judgment there. And, and, uh, and for those who have rejected the Lord, they'll be put away in hell and, and then there'll be heaven. So you kind of missed the whole thing, didn't you? Uh, you missed kind of a lot of the whole Bible and the whole purpose of God choosing Israel and the plans and the promises that were spiritual and the promises that were physical. And it's sad for me because that group has no way to interpret what's written right on the page and even the simplest things in the book of Revelation, which is amazing. But it's obvious that he's going to come back and he's going to you know, come back and rule in Israel and it's going to be a thousand year reign and, and all of that as well. So let's look at this judgment, verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd uh, separates the sheep from the goats. And he will, be, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, by the way, that's a pretty, this is a pretty quick judgment. <laughs> and it could match what's, you know, we talk about the judgment, some are taken and some are left, right? So this isn't like a one by one thing. This is two groups. You're either in two categories. And he's going to explain what each category represents. So this could happen pretty quickly, couldn't it? He says, he says, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And again, this is a physical kingdom. This is only those who are still alive at the coming of the Lord. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. They just made it through the last three and a half years of the tribulation, didn't they? Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did did we see you hungry and, and feed you? By the way, they're already put in the right side there with the sheep, right? And when did we see you and, uh, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? He says, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and he'll say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them you did it to me. An interesting way to bring a judgment here. It's be a quick way to do it. Is what did you do with the Jews in this last three and a half years? Did you stand with them? Were you willing to uh, protect them, or um, even for other believers? How did you treat those? Because they didn't have the mark of the beast, did they? And because they couldn't be saved, uh, you know, after taking the mark, and that means they decided Satan was their their lord. So. He says, uh, when you did it to them, you did it unto me. So it's going to be a works-based judgment that will reveal where your heart is. Trust me, you will not help a believer or a Jewish person in the last three and a half years. of. of your, first of all, you're just going to be trying to live. But you don't want any of this trouble of trying to help those who are defying the Antichrist and all the judgment that comes with it. Only way you would do that is if you believed in the Lord and you said, you know, I don't care if I die with you, I'm helping you, right? But particularly the Jewish people, and that's what the believers would do. They would help uh, one of the Jewish people there. Then he will say to those on his left hand, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not invite me in and naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then uh, they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it. 
unto me. These will go away into eternal punishment, um, but the righteous into e eternal life. So, interesting. What's the Lord going to have at the end of this time? Before this gets started here, and whoever enters in will enter into this, um, again, this marriage feast. People often ask this, they say, well, who's going to go into the millennium? Well, after understanding this, we know that only those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will go into that time. Whoever's left on the earth, everything will be sorted out. And there will be no rebellion and no rebellious people or no people that hate the Lord. They're going to start in the kingdom of the Lord. And uh, so only believers who believe on the Lord will enter into that kingdom. That's just trouble for a lot of people who don't understand the end times and some people who have struggles over the rapture of the church. Some would say, well, the Lord's going to rapture the church out, you know, at the end, but the church is going to have to go through the tribulation and, okay, make a lot of arguments for it, but the problem that I have with that is if at the time of the appearing of the Lord in the air... Because that's where the Bible says you're going to be raptured to, the Lord in the air. If he takes out all the believers on the face of the earth, then who's left to sort out down below? It's just, a, it's just the rejectors. There's no, there's no sheep, there's no goats in this. And so it doesn't even make sense. And then if that were true and we're rise to be with the Lord, and the Bible says we'll, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says when we look on him, we'll be like him. And uh, there was going to be a transformation bodily, right? So we're going to have glorified bodies. And so um, if we did, uh, you know, come back there, then there wouldn't be a point of it because we already have glorified bodies, you know, to go into this kingdom. If he gets rid of all of the wicked there, then everybody there will have glorified bodies and then there would be no judgment at the end of the millennium. So uh, pretty interesting here. Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, and we don't have time to cover that tonight. But if you go back and you read from verse 1, it'll make more sense to you. Um, of this judgment that the Lord's going to uh, put upon Israel and also on the earth uh, at his coming and, uh, and the emphasis that is about being faithful to the Lord um, until he comes and those who make it uh, to the end. You say, what about those who died during that time? Will Jewish people die during that time of tribulation? It sounds like they will. Um, they'll be a part of the martyred dead, those who were put to death uh, for their faith. Don't weep for them. <laughs> they get a better seat at the table because the, when he resurrects them, they're going to get glorified bodies and they'll be a part of those who rule and reign with, uh, with Christ like us. And so no weeping for anybody uh, who dies in that time. It's just a special group who makes it to that end. And that's the group that's going to go into the, to the millennial kingdom. And so this is the Lord saying to Israel, yes, you are going to get another chance, but it's going to be rough, rough for you. He'll go on to explain much more about the church and many passages about the church to the disciples. And they, in turn, will write you know, a lot of the books of the New Testament. So... We get our marching orders. We understand our thing here. But this is a unique section for Israel. And it ties up all of those loose ends over fulfilling all of these physical promises to Israel. And for the reason that he said, you will, won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus will be King of kings and Lord of lords. The earth will, again, will enter into peace, never to be overtaken by a rebellion ever again. Praise the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we love you tonight. You're the judge. You get to be the judge. And Lord, we are so thankful that we will not be judged for our sin. The only reason we won't be judged, we deserve to be judged for it. 
but it's because of your graciousness to us and your son offering him in our place and that we could be covered by the blood of your son Jesus and we could, we could uh, stand before you righteous through his righteousness at his expense and you were so kind to account his righteousness unto us and uh, that we could stand before you, Lord, and, and, uh, and, and you would say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. And Lord, we are so thankful uh, and look forward to that day. But woe to the world, woe to Israel, Lord, so much is coming and we see it and we see it unfolding and we want to pray for this earth, Lord, and the men and women that are on it, Lord, that their hearts would turn to your son, Jesus. There's no hope without your son. And, uh, and Lord, we thank you for that truth. Give us boldness to be faithful to you until you come uh, for us in the rapture. Um, but Lord, we want to use what you've given us, Lord, and be faithful with it. And uh, we're thankful to you that you will reward us for it. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.